How are you? Hi, right, good. Good, Chris. Hey, my dog is barking a little here because I've got someone fixing something outside. I'm hoping he's going to calm down. Oh, no problem. <laughs> hey, where are you located? I'm outside of Minneapolis. Yeah, so cool. Yeah. Thanks for uh, wanting to do this. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else to do with him. Um, uh, you hear that? It's loud, isn't it? It's fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he'll calm down. Okay. You know, the guy who's he's behind right now, he can't see him. He's fixing something, but he'll come back around and he'll bark again, then he'll leave. Okay. All right. Well, so I could just try and focus more on things that you don't talk about as much in interviews. Sure, whatever you want. So I know uh, professionally, um, it started with uh, modeling for the Zoli agency. Yes, I was uh, in school at Syracuse University. And one of the professors there uh, in one of the schools there, uh, in one of the departments saw me and said, uh, are you ever interested in being a model? And I said, well, no, you know, I really want to be a filmmaker or an actor. Um, he said, well, let me take some photos of you. His name was Michael Butler. And he took some shots of me and he knew Zoli. So he sent those shots down to his, the Zoli agency in New York and they liked my look and they said, come on in and meet us. So uh, I took a trip down to New York and I met them and, uh, and they took me on, which I was surprised. I was never in my realm of thinking that I was gonna be a model, but um, they took me on and they immediately sent me to, uh, to Italy, to Milan, to get great tear sheets and do all, you know, the Womo Vogue and Men's Bazaar, Italian Men's Bazaar and a bunch of ads there. So I did that and a few shows and I came back uh, to New York and it was, and it helped my career because then I had a little, not only experience, but I had some terrific things in there from well-known magazines in Europe. So I, uh, I started uh, working and doing a lot as a model in New York. It was cool. And was how you would have gotten the SAG be the commercials that you did? early on oh, you're, you're good <laughs> yes so uh they submitted me uh one of the bookers there for the very first one was called corvettes which was a department store in new york or i don't know if it was just new york um and i got booked and the funny thing about it is i have a scar on my knee from when i was a kid i was building a fort uh we had you know cut you know some little trees down uh to build the fort and i fell and, you know, it was, what was left of this, the tree was like this and my knee, not my knee, but yeah, my knee, just above my knee went through it and it went literally into my leg and out so quickly. I had no idea. Um, but I'm walking around and my brother said, what, why do you have, what's on your leg? I said, oh, it's just probably just ju juice from berries or something. And I put my pants down and it was just a, a hole like this in my leg. Um, so so back to the story, um, I have this scar on my knee and I go to this audition and I'm going to have to be in shorts. So I think, well, what am I going to do about it? I, I don't want them to see that scar. So I take hair from another part of my body and I use crazy glue and I glue it to that scar and it looked great, man. It was like, oh, no one's ever going to see I have a scar here because in this, in, this, in this spot, I'm in regular clothing and I say, and look at this Terry sportswear and I pop into shorts and it's some Terry ridiculous outfit. So I go in the audition and, you know, I, I, get, I arrive at the audition and I go into the bathroom prior to the audition and I do that. That's when I added the, the hair to my leg. And then I came out and I had to wait like an hour to get in for my turn. And during that time, I had no idea, but it, well, I, I, it's my turn. I get in there and, and they're looking at me and they say, take your pants down so we can see your legs. And I take them down and they're all staring at my knee. And I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? And I look down and during that hour, it had dried white. <laughs> so, so instead of saving it, I drew attention to it. And they said, what happened? And I explained the whole story. They said, you got the commercial. It's yours. <laughs> so that's, that's how I got my first spot in mm -hmm. you know, my, my SAG card. But uh, it was booked through the Zoli agency at the time. And then uh, a few others after that. Well, yeah, I was going to ask, are there any special stories with the ones that you did for like McDonald's and Hawaiian Punch and Michelob? <laughs> you, know, you did good research. <laughs> Hawaiian Punch, it was very funny because we were shooting that on a boat. In fact, it was, I think it was Tony Scott, the film director, it was his boat uh, oh. down in Long Beach. And we shot it over two days because we were doing a 30 second and a 60 second spot. And we were doing the cans and the, those cartons that had just come out, you know, which are popular now. So uh, 
you know, I usually don't get seasick and the girl said she didn't either, but we're on this boat and it's going like this and we're drinking the sugary stuff. I always loved Hawaiian punch as a kid. I loved it. I always got that. And, but where, and it was a cold day and overcast. So they had to really light it to make it look like it was nice. And we had to, you know, be just smiling, enjoying that drink. Um, and we're vomiting nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd like, you know, hey, you know, smile, hold the fire, and then cut <laughs> into a bucket. And it just went on for two days like that. Yeah. So what looks terrific on there was kind of a horrific experience. Um, but it played so much between the 30s, the 60s, the can, the carton, that the residuals were incredible. Mm -hmm. So so I'm glad I did it. And what was the second one you said? The um, McDonald's. A McDonald's, that was a, that was a fun one because I played an actor and it was, uh, it was at some McDonald's that I forget what, I guess they just closed that McDonald's for the day. It wasn't a fake one that's just sometimes used. And, um, you know, I'm looking at variety and uh, I circle an ad and I hold the Big Mac and say, someday I'm gonna make it big. And then the song comes in, Big Mac Big. And then I'm up on a screen playing the piano with this beautiful girl that comes around me. And I just thought it was so cool, first of all, to be doing a national McDonald's commercial, right. which was fantastic. And then to be an actor in the commercial. So it, it was great. Well, does oh, I'll tell you another commercial that didn't happen, that happened, but didn't happen, um, which no one really knows about. I got booked for a big uh, Coke commercial with Whitney Houston, and it was for the Super Bowl. Oh, and I thought, oh my God, this is going to be just skyrocket my career because so many people are going to see it. And so I'm watching the Super Bowl and I'm not in it. So I contact that. And the shot was, it was, they, they call it uh, the martini shot, the last shot of the day. It was the sunset and it had to be perfect that the sun setting behind me in Pacific Palisades and me with a Coke and drinking it and smoking into the camera. And uh, sorry about the dog. Um, and I guess the light wasn't right when it happened. So they cut it from the final spot. From the, so it was a shame. Yeah. Well, based off what I looked up, it does seem like with you, people, the uh, Michelob commercial the most. Oh, the Michelob. Oh, that's, yeah, that was fun too. I forgot about that one. Um, oh yeah, it's, it's a party and I'm with a girl in the closet and it opens right. up and we're laughing. Oh yeah. I, I don't remember much about that one. I don't know where we shot it. Um, I don't even know how old I was or where that was in my career, but, uh, but that ran well too. I mean, for <laughs> actors, it's all about the residuals. Yeah. Because you don't get a lot to actually shoot it, but, uh, the residuals were terrific on all three of those. Yeah. So how did you become involved in, um, you know, Zero Alone then? My agent at that time in New York had submitted me for that. And I went on the audition. I met, uh, Armand Mastriani, the director, and... I believe it was in New York City that I, the audition was. And it, you know, there are very few lines, you know, in it. Um, but we met, we hit it off, our personalities clicked. And I read and he said, you're fine, you got the role. And then my shoot was only one day, literally, in Staten Island where they shot the film. And of course, Tom Hanks was in the movie. Yep. You know, that was his first movie, but poor Tom, nothing ever happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> and I never saw him. I never saw anybody else in the film. Oh, okay. But it was a thrill to be the opening of the movie and you know the movie within the movie so we get killed and of course i got killed the exact same way you know a number of years later doing um friday the 13th part two so yeah. is this how i get cast <laughs> yeah, do i have to get a slit throat upside down in every project yeah <laughs> it was funny well the main the main thing i wanted to ask about friday because i know that you've talked about it like nonstop. was just um does the, the did the did the fan impact on that movie uh, surprise you? Tremendously. I mean, when you're making a film like that or any film, you have no idea, yeah. you know, what the life is beyond the actual, you know, first release. But it's, I mean, the franchise is just, it's amazing uh, the legs it has and, and how many people around the globe are, are enjoying that franchise. And, and many of them think, the one that I was in part two is their favorite, which I yeah. love. It's great. You know, at these conventions, people come up all the time and, and say, you were in my favorite one. I said, you want to buy a picture? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, horror fans, like soap opera fans, I did a soap opera for three years, but horror fans are tremendously faithful and they know more than you know. I, I can't tell you how many facts I've been given about the franchise. Yeah that I just don't know because quite honestly, I, I, you know, I saw mine 
and I saw part four because my death was lifted part from part one and put in part four. Uh, but I think I saw maybe parts of part three, but I, I really haven't been following it because uh, I've been busy doing other things. But I really appreciate how how terrific horror fans are. And then what was the um, the pilot that you did that never went anywhere? Uh, where did you get this stuff from? <laughs> Spaghetti and Chitlins? Yeah. Was it that one? Yeah, about an Italian and a black living together. And it was the guy from, oh my God, what he was he was well known from another show. Do you, did you know who he was? Um, no, I just saw the name. Yeah, I can't remember his name. But he was a well-known actor. And we shot that on us in the studio in Hollywood. Um, but the story was just kind of silly and goofy and you know so many pilots are made and and never obviously get to series and unfortunately we were one of them mm -hmm. so was that right after friday that you moved to la uh let's see i moved to la in 1983 okay so yeah yeah and then as soon as i got here uh i'm, I'm sure it's a story i've told before and i don't know if you know it but uh i was getting my hair cut in a barbershop, not a barbershop, but someone's home, this guy named Jerry Esposito. And he put my picture up on the wall right around the mirror. And Alan Carr, the producer, walked in and saw it. And he said, who is that guy? And he said, that's Russell Todd. He's, he's new in town. He's, and Alan said, he's going to star in my next movie. So <laughs> I got called in for an audition. And I you know, called back two or three times. And I read with Lisa Hartman, who was my love interest in the movie. And um, I got the part. Yeah, but it was like that Lana Turner story of her being discovered in Schwab's drug, uh, drug store, which is not a true story, but uh, folklore. Yeah. How'd you get along with um, Lisa throughout the entirety of that movie? We got along great. Uh, we really, it was really easy working with her. And when we weren't working, we'd go to the gym together to work out in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we stayed friends afterward. We'd go to stuff together. I think she was dating Barry Bostwick at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but she was very sweet and we laughed a lot. Uh, we sweated a lot in the heat of Fort Lauderdale and that humidity making this movie, but we had a lot of fun. It was, it was a good time. And Alan Carr was a riot. He was, uh, he's a character as you probably know. Um, but, uh, he always did well by me and, um, it was a great experience. Did you have much interaction with the other girls? Yeah. Lorna Luft. We did actually all of them, Wendy Shaw, Lynn Holly Johnson. We'd all go out together when we weren't working. Uh, we all got along, you know. They were more famous than I was. I was not that well known at all. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was very nice that they were, you know, very chill and and cool with me. Um, and and uh, Dan McDonald and his brother Chris McDonald, who became really kind of big star. Um, but yeah, everyone got along well. You know, when you have a young cast, there's not that much attitude. Hopefully there's not, you know, and, and you're just trying to work together to make a good project and make a fun show. Around that same time, did you um, get the opportunity to audition for anything that was, uh, that went on to be like really iconic? Hmm. I'm trying to think what else there was. I think it was, I don't know if it was before or after that, but I did audition for Endless Love with Brooke Shields. No, that, that was before, yeah. That was before, yeah, that was well before there. And I did a screen test for that. In fact, we really went far. We, we, we all went out together a number of times and I was pretty much assured that I was getting this role. Wow. And then one, then one day they told me, no, it's not happening. And so I was bummed about that. Yeah. Because that was, that was also Tom, Tom Cruise's first movie. Tom Cruise was in that? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, I did audition for a movie that Tom got the part. Um, oh. Taps, I think it was yeah. called. Yeah. Yeah. So we auditioned for that same role. Okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are those, the, are those like the main instances that you can remember with? I auditioned for Blow Up, uh, Brian De Palma. Blow yeah, Blow Out. Thank you, yeah. Blow Out. Uh, but I've told this story too before, but he... When I read for Brian De Palma in an office, he was on the telephone. I walk in, he's on there, and the casting woman's over here. And I, I'm like, why are we reading? He's not even looking. And we do the audition. He never looks up once. And then I leave and I look at her like this, and she goes, call me. So I get home and like late at the end of the day, I give her a ring. 
I said, what was that about? She goes, when you walked in the room, he knew you weren't right for the part and he doesn't care. Oh, so they just, you know, that's it. And I thought, wow, that's pretty disrespectful. Yeah. You, know, you work so hard as an actor, you know, you study the scenes, all the nerves, you know, everything that goes on with an audition. And he never even looked up. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not well, because I know both, all three of those were um, based in New York. So was there anything like that when you got to LA that you got to read for? Um, no, I can't think of anything that was really big okay. in LA. You know, I read for lots of TV series. I did a TV series with Robert Conrad. I don't know if you have that, but uh, yeah. called High Mountain Rangers, uh, which we shot for a year up in the High Sierras. That was terrific. I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, we were always opposite facts of life. Oh. And I knew Mindy Cohn, who starred in that, one of the stars of that show. And every week when we'd go and, and, and the uh, ratings would have, she'd call me and laugh. <laughs> Because they would kill us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good experience. Um, but I did a lot of fun things. Um, I One of the most fun I ever had, most uh, enjoyable uh, guest star jobs was playing an oceanographer on a series called Riptide yep. with Joe Penny. And my dad was Cesar Romero, which, I mean, what a thrill to have Cesar Romero, you know, to work with him. And... Um, we both only spoke Italian in the episode. Actually, they liked it a lot and they brought us back to do a second episode. Uh, I think one was called Riva Derci, baby. I forget what the other one was. But and when, we, when we weren't shooting, I would sit down next to Caesar and I'd say, tell me stories. And he'd go, well, what do you want me to talk about? I said, just anything you would tell me would be interesting. You know, it's like, it's like opening a history book. And he would say, well, you're a generation, you don't have style like we did. You know, we would dress up in white tuxedos and everyone had class, who knows? He goes, and he would tell me stories of playing tennis at Pickfair with, with Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford. I mean, oh my God, you know, <laughs> people I read about in film school. Yeah. But he was a, he was a great guy. And uh, Chuck Connors, who was the rifleman, we did a movie together. Um, one last run, it was called, and he was he was such a gentleman. He was so nice, so that was a thrill. And uh, I did a western um, with um, oh my god, do you know <laughs> uh, giant legend of westerns, uh, Glenn Ford? Yeah, border shootout. Border shootout, exactly. We shot that in a, in it used to be a western town in New Mexico, but I think it burned down since. But that was also very cool to to work with him. What was your experience on Throb? Throb, oh my God, I barely remember Throb. I, I was pretty much a glorified extra. Okay. That was with, what's her name who ended up on Frasier? Uh, she had a British accent. I can't remember her name. She was a star, one of the stars on Frasier. Um, but I was literally there, you know, maybe a couple of days to shoot on Throb. And, and that was really one of my first experiences, acting. Yeah. What about with our capital? Capital was fun because one of my good friends, uh, Nicholas Walker, was a regular on that show. And I only did that show because the actor, Todd Curtis, in real life, crashed his car and literally went through his windshield Mm -hmm. and scarred his face terribly, unfortunately. And they called me in to replace him. So I, I went in, I did the job, and I loved the people in there. And, you know, it was at CBS Television City, which isn't that far from me. And um, that was just a, a great, it was a, a fun story. He was the main family. Jordy Clegg was my character. And they told me, well, he's healing. He's coming back to the show. And I'm thinking, no, you don't really want him back. <laughs> but, but they did, of course. And they said, you're going to have to crash your car on your last day and go through the windshield. And so, I said, I'm not getting into that car. You know, I won't. And this is a joke. But the last day they had me, you know, driving and big close up these lights glare in my face and I make an expression you know of horror and the next scene not the next scene but next time you see me they're taking the bandages off and it's his face again Mm -hmm. but that was a good experience and then the same studio uh, also Bill Bell the same producer they called me in on Young and the Restless when Don Diamant who played um, uh, Brad Carlton and Don and the character Brad were beloved by everyone because he was one of the top guys in soaps, most well-known. But he had uh, an issue and they asked me to come in and they weren't sure how long that job was going to be either. So, you know, that, that was cool with me. 
So I went in and did that. And once, you know, they air a certain amount of days after you do them. Um, and once it started airing, I would leave the studio and fans would like to hang out at the back door at CBS and get autographs and things of everyone. And when I would leave the studio, we hate you, people would say, we, we want Don back. You know, <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you playing the role? And I said, I'm sorry, it's just, you know, it's a job. I didn't, I didn't ask, you know, to do it. There, Don couldn't do it right now. So it was really interesting. Every day I'd go in there, I was being faced with this negativity. Yeah. But it was fine. I'm glad I did that too. Was it a better experience on, a, on Another World for you then? Yeah. Yeah. Another World was great. Uh, did three years on that, Dr. Jamie Frame, and got to play opposite Anne Hayes, who's a terrific actress, and Jensen Buchanan also, uh, who replaced her when she left. Um, but that, that was wonderful. We shot that in Brooklyn, New York. Although the one weird thing that happened there too, it was interesting, was I'm there maybe two, three weeks and they write into the story that Jamie and Marley are gonna go to Nice, France oh. and fall in love. And they never do remote, especially, that, well, they may do a remote you know, locally, but you know, to, to travel to Europe to do a remote. So they're taking me and Anne. So we go there for 10 days and shoot. Well, the other actors who have been working in a studio in Brooklyn were not happy with that at all. And they, they scorned me <laughs> again. I did nothing, you know, I'm just doing the job. Yeah. And I remember the resentment from, from some of them uh, for getting to go to Europe on, uh, you know, on NBC uh, to do that. But I had a blast on that show. Um, worked with Carmen Duncan, who I love, John Aprea. Uh, Carmen, unfortunately, has passed since. Um, but, uh, and my mother on there uh, was great. Uh, everyone, everyone knew. It was, uh, it was nice. I had never done a soap for three years. So, you know, it's a factory. You're, you're spreading these things out 50 weeks a year. You get two weeks off and you have to put in for that vacation long before so they can write it into the story. Mm -hmm. Just like when I broke my foot uh, during the three years I was there, they wrote it into the story that Jamie uh, was playing tennis and broke his foot. Yeah. But it's a great experience for an actor. And, you know, financially, it's good to you have a, as an actor. It's wonderful to have a paycheck. Um, and it was nice to be in New York because when you weren't working, we shot in Brooklyn, but I was living in New York City. But what a great place to live. Mm -hmm. Well, I know around the same time you started, you started on uh, Another World that you got to be in a sweet murder. Yes, yes. Which we shot in Johannesburg, yes. South Africa. Uh, Percival Rubens is the director's name. And I forget how that audition came about, but I remember going to some house in Coldwater Canyon uh, and reading for him. And again, it was just such a brief audition. I read and he says, you're, you're perfect for this role. Let's do it. Uh, and M. Beth Davis was in that movie who was in Schindler's List. Um, and all of a sudden I'm flying to Joburg and we were there three or four weeks shooting it. Um, and then I stayed an extra week, uh, about maybe 10 days, and I went to uh, Kruger National Park and, and did a safari. You know, you get to see all the animals, which was amazing. Everyone, if they have the ability to, to see animals in the wild like that, is incredible. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, it's interesting. Everything else we've talked about, or most of it, there are still fans and people will stop me perhaps somewhere where I am or, or at the conventions, of course. But no one ever mentioned Sweet Murder. <laughs> Well, I've also, it was a while ago, but I did, I did interview on um, Helene Udy. Oh, you did? Yeah. So I played opposite. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Or no, well, yeah, she was one, she was the killer. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. And I, I'm sure is there still like a huge fan following with you for Chopping Mall? Chopping Mall, yes. That's one that also has incredible legs. You know, it's not part of a franchise. It's a, it's a one-off. Right. But Wow, people love it. And it's amazing. We will still do screenings, uh, you know, and well, I live in LA, so in that area, and they will sell out. Yep. And then we do a Q&A after, and they're just so jazzed about it. It's great. <laughs> Fun movie to make. And um, there was even talk of doing, not another movie, but I think trying to do a TV series based on the characters. But uh, Jim Winarski, the director, I'm not sure if he's still trying to pull that off or not. But it was at a mall called the Sherman Oaks Galleria, which is, was around for years. It's now no longer a mall. It's mostly offices. But we would go there when the stores would close and just wreak havoc and get chased by these killer robots and break windows and running around with, you know, AR-15s and, and trying to stay alive for the night. Um, 
it was a weird experience, uh, but a lot of fun. Yeah. Did you become friends with any of those cast members? John Terleski, who became a director. Yeah, we were friends for a while. Antonio O'Dell, who was the main star. Kelly Maroney. And I see Kelly, you know, on, often when we do these conventions, because she's usually there. And also at the screenings, Tony and Kelly and myself, because we're in L.A., we, we usually show up. Mm -hmm. uh, so we get to see each other. And I know, I guess, like one of the last things that you did was uh, Bold and the Beautiful before. No, no, that was that was around the same time I did Young and the Restless. But I was only on that for a brief time. I was like a red herring. They threw me in there, some character. So the audience would think I was a killer, but I really wasn't the killer. OK, but that's all I remember the storyline. You know, I don't know what, who the other characters were or anything, but they, all three of those were at, at uh, CBS in Hollywood. Yep. But another world, as I said, was in Brooklyn and New York. What yeah. uh, what uh, was there something that happened that made you want to leave acting? You know, doing three years on a soap opera like, again as an actor, I'm, it's a terrific experience. Any actor, most actors would want to do that. But you're playing the same character, and I had the thrill of playing so many things prior to that that I didn't find it as exciting or as rewarding. So. I forget at what point I went to the producers. I said, you know, thank you for this. I love it. But at the end of my contract, I'm definitely moving on, you know. And that's when they sent Jamie in my last day, you know, they sent him to France for a doctor's convention and he never came back. Mm -hmm. Well, I was glad they never replaced me. That was nice. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just love doing the other, you know, the other kinds of, you know, characters. And, and that's what acting really meant to me, the variety. But when I did come back after I left the soap opera, I went on just a couple of auditions for commercials just to wrap out everything. And I got one with Sharon Stone. Oh. And she actually picked me herself to play opposite her. And it's a commercial for William Lawson Scotch. And if you, or if you were to Google Sharon Stone and the word Scotch, it'll pop up. It's a black and white spot. Okay. And it's terrific. It's a takeoff on Basic Instinct, you know, where she spreads her legs in the police office there. Um, I play, uh, we're in an elevator and this guy in a kilt and no shirt is walking through the lobby of a hotel and everyone's looking at him, attractive guy. And he comes to the elevator, it opens up and Sharon and I come out and I'm in a tuxedo and she's looking beautiful in a, in a nice gown and we're going on a date. And she looks at him up and down and I look at her like, you're with me. And we, she goes and sits down, sits down on the couch and I go up to the desk for, to ask for something. And he sits down in a chair across from her or next to her. And they're looking back and forth at each other. And I'm getting jealous. And I come back and I sit down and I give him like the evil eye. And then he looks at me and he unspreads his legs to <laughs> me. <laughs> and he's not wearing any underwear. <laughs> and then it, it cuts to Sharon and she's laughing hysterical. And it goes, William Lawson Scotch. It's a terrific spot. Yeah. So that was the last thing I did. Um, and then I ended up, uh, my friend who was... Uh, working at a big agency for the below the line talent, like DPs, production designers, costumers and editors. Um, he said, they're looking for someone to work in the TV department here. Uh, do you want to? And I said, oh, I just came off a show. I don't know about that. But I met them and I liked the people there and I went to work there. And that's where uh, one guy walked in and said, do you represent Steadicam operators? And I said, let me get back to you. And I found out that no one was doing it. And I started the first division of Steadicam operators anywhere, in, I guess, in the world. Um, and I grew that agency there for about two years. And I went on my own 22 years ago. And I've been doing that ever since. Mm -hmm. Do you ever uh, have the need to go back to acting? or? I don't have the need. No, that's an interesting <laughs> word. I like that. Uh, I don't have a need. Um, but if someone were to ask me, to do a part, would I do it? Yes, without a doubt. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's always something that I think is in you, you know, it, it was a wonderful part of my life, all those experiences. Uh, but if, yeah, if someone were to ask me, uh, you know, I, I, I would definitely consider it. Well, I could, I could imagine too that you're friends with lots of people who are in the industry still. Yeah, I still know writers, directors, producers, all of that. Um, and they know, you know, I've, I've been extremely happy being an agent for the last 22 years. I, I think it's the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. Um, I love the negotiating. I love my clients. It's, I, uh, 
I love talking to them. I love talking to the producers. And, and when a when a DP calls me, a director of photography that calls me that I respect and I know their work, I you know I feel like a fan sometimes. And I gush a little, and I realize just shut up, Russell. Just talk professionally. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember a quick story. Vilmos Zygmunt, who's done a million well-known movies, DP. He's with the agency I first worked at. And when I was brought to meet him, I like shook his hand. Vilmos, I just got to tell you, I loved it. You know, you did an incredible job on Close Encounters. And, you know, growing up, I wanted to be a filmmaker because of you. Blah, blah, blah. He goes, oh, that's great. Anyway, move that light. Let's do this. And it was like, oh, don't ever, don't ever do that again. <laughs> Sorry about the dog again. Oh, my final question is always asking, what do you want your legacy to be? Is what? I'm sorry? What do you, what do you want your legacy to be? Well, I don't know if my legacy is as important as what did I do uh, as an actor? I think my legacy is I want to be thought of that he was a good guy and that he was decent to other people and treated people fairly and kindly. Um, and I mean, I think it's great that when I'm gone long after that, you know, these things will still be running and people get to see you for, you know, eternity, whatever that is. <laughs> um, but I would more, I would rather be thought of as, uh, you know, as an individual who's a nice guy and people like being with and, uh, and, and, thought, and, and respected in that regard rather, rather than my work. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad we got through this. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I know I wanted to make a talk about stuff that I didn't ever see you talk about. So. No, that's great. I love that. You uh, you had terrific research, and uh, that's that's very true. A lot of that stuff people never asked me, so that that's great. Thanks. Yeah, we'll have a good rest of your day then. Thank you. You too. You take care. Bye.